preaching to the choir kind of thing. You, you assume they have a certain level of understanding and, and that's not effective communication. So I want to pray first and then I'll expound on that. Father, thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day. Every week, Lord, you have created this time, carved it out of our lives that we can come to you. We can worship you. We can sing praises to you and we can dwell in your presence in this building with our family. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit be here with us today. May the words that come forth be your words. May they be accepted into the heart as you want them to be accepted. May you touch our hearts. If there is something in the message, Lord, that we need to change, if there's something that you need us to do, please, we pray that you grant us the strength and that you give us the wisdom. Thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> So like I said, uh, I came into the message assuming, from my perspective, that I knew what I was talking about, but I want to make sure that you know what I'm talking about. Um, I got to be careful because I can quickly walk off the camera if I go that way. Um, we all understand that the only way we can do anything for the Lord is through his own strength, right? Nothing we can do, our strength is not sufficient. We can't earn our own salvation. We can't work our way to salvation or to heaven. It's all through God's grace and his strength that it's even possible. But there is a part that we play in this process. And so with that, we'll get started. Anyone, so I gave this out last Sabbath to everyone who was here. And we're going to be mailing some out to those who weren't here. But if you don't have a copy of this book, we'll get you one on the way out today. But did anyone read this book in the last week? Arlita? Yeah, okay. Couple? Three? So after today, I hope you go home and you read it. Because um, if I tried to do a, a message on something this thick, no, that, not that it's long, we'd be here a couple hours. And I don't want to do that to you. But... Um, it's important that we have the proper view of who we are. And so, um, when you read the title of the message, if you read it in the bulletin, or if you're just now, you know, what is he actually talking about? The title is, Who Do We Think We Are? So, it's interesting in the English language, you can give inflection to one word or another, and it changes the whole meaning of the statement. So when I read that, or when you read it, how did you read it? Did you read it with kind of an inquisitive, interesting, hmm, who do we think we are? Or did you read it in more of a kind of like, who do we think we are? Kind of in a more defensive way. Yeah, it, it's interesting that just one word can change the whole meaning of a, of a sentence. Um, and the way you read it might actually say something about how you see yourself or how you see people. So as I was preparing for the message, um, yeah, I was praying and as I always do, I, I want the Lord to impress upon me what he wants me to say, the topic he wants me to speak about. And um, I do a lot of reading or I, I have like started three or four different books. I'm kind of all in the same process of reading them. And this topic came to me when I was reading a book called Atomic Habits. It's kind of an odd name, but if you think about an atom is like one of the small, the smallest thing. There may be some doubt in the world as whether there's something smaller than an atom. I don't know. But so uh, atoms are very tiny, right? Very small things. And when you attach that to a habit, it might seem counterintuitive that such a small thing can actually become a habit. But that's the premise of the book is that you can build lifelong habits through very small activities. And as you change these small activities, they add up to be lifelong changes. And the author says that often people fail to make these lasting life changes because they're not able to stick to the small things. And um, the small changes that they have tried to make in their life. They may change their behavior or even their activities for a time, but because they don't see themselves or believe themselves to be this, this new person or this, um, this new image of themselves that they want to be, they fall back into the same old ways. So an example he gives is um, you have two people who are trying to quit smoking. Okay, and you come to, to them each individually and you offer them 
a cigarette. And one says, no, no, I'm trying to quit. And the other says, no, thank you, I'm not a smoker. Which of the two do you think is more likely to be successful at quitting? The first, who's trying to quit, or the one who sees themselves as a non-smoker? The image that you have of who you are can have a long-lasting impact of how your life is led. So this got me thinking a little bit about our Christian walk, Christians in general, who we are. Um, and I was trying to think of an example, and I was like, when, you, when I was younger, you know, I used to pretend and play that I was an army man or a policeman or cops and robbers, you know, that kind of thing. When you were younger, did, did any of you do that? You know, kind of imagine and pretend that you were someone else or something else, you know, your dog and chasing whatever bird that you were flying through the air, you know, or, or, or fireman, you know, or a biblical figure, you were Daniel, right? Or um, something like that. You'd mimic what you thought this person was or, or this thing was like. You'd take on those mannerisms, you would, even the persona, you know, that word's kind of being more popular nowadays. A persona is, like in the business world, it's, it's character traits or attributes of a person or a group of people that then you can use to kind of tailor a message to. So, you know, there's, the millennials was big. Of how do you manage millennials? Because they're a totally different group of people from like the boomers or the Gen Zers, right? Totally different. Each generation has its own unique situation, right? Some of you grew up when there were still rotary telephones or there was party lines. Anybody remember those? Any of party lines? So my grandparents had a party line and as a kid I used to like to pick up the phone, oops, sorry, pick up the phone and listen to other people's conversations because <laughs> it was all one line, right? They didn't, if you don't know what that means, there was one phone line and everybody connected to it and if you were talking, anyone picked up, they got connected to the line and they could hear what you were saying. My grandmother, boy, when she caught me doing that. <laughs> so, you know, you, you might put on that uniform or that costume of that, of that person. But sometimes these pretend activities, you know, they carry on into our adult lives. Is there anyone here who is doing what they thought they were going to do when they were little? Like that dream they had of that career and now they're doing it? Anyone? Yeah, I see one person nodding yes. Anybody else? Nobody else, right. Oftentimes who we want to be or who we think we are is not actually who we end up becoming. That can be a good thing sometimes. <laughs> so for, for you who are doing what you thought you were going to do when you're little, those transitions, they take a focused effort right? They take planning and they often take sacrifice. But if you see yourself as that person, then these efforts to get there, they're just stepping stones, right? It's just one thing you do after another to get you to that point. They're not mountains that are insurmountable or that become difficult to climb because it's just part of the process. I know Joy and Kathleen are both in the medical field, so is my daughter. I don't, I don't know what you wanted to be when you were little girls. I don't know. Oh, so she is doing what she <laughs> she wanted to do. So I imagine it was, you know, you when you got a little older, it was maybe caring for your brother or pets or, you know, and then you started getting into school and it was a focusing on the classes you took. It was thinking about which college you would go to. Maybe it was going on mission trips with a specific bent of nursing or healthcare in mind. All these things, you know, that you you, you see yourself as something and you work towards that effort. It's very popular today to self-identify. That's the new thing. Um, all over the place, you see people putting labels on themselves or on others. You know, labeling yourself as he, she, no, she, her, he, him, they, them. That's the other one, yeah. I thought they and them were always plural, but I guess I've been wrong for a long time. Mostly plural. But, you know, some people, they really fully embrace these labels. So much so that they're even willing to physically change their body to take on this image of themselves. This label that they have put on themselves. That's commitment. 
or in some cases I think it's foolishness. How do we see ourselves today? I'm going to pause here in a moment because I want you to think about this. Take a mental look at your life now, today. Who are you? What comes to mind when I ask that question? Might be a lot of things, right? Husband, father for me, person ministries leader, Bible worker, kingdom worker, you know, the, all kinds of these different labels. Um, you know, I'm a manager at work. I was a designer, all these things, you know, that we kind of label them, we put on ourselves. So I don't have social media like Facebook or Instagram or any of that kind of stuff. The only one I have is LinkedIn, and I've been on that a little more recently because of some things some of you know about. But there's a man that I work with, and his, his label right underneath his name is Kingdom Worker. That's the very first thing he wants people to know about himself. He's a Christian. And that's his bent. When you talk to him, he will somehow turn it, turn it to a conversation about faith. It's actually kind of nice to talk to him. Stephen met him uh, two weeks ago, a week ago. His name is Caleb. But it's pretty amazing because that's how he sees himself. So what are your primary activities? What takes the most of your time? Right? What do you spend most of your time doing? It might not be fair you know, to kind of question that because some of us have responsibilities that take a lot of time. I know Bill, his work, he's shorthanded. He's in an engineering group that's very shorthanded and so he takes on the role and responsibilities of multiple engineers. He's very busy, right? So that's what he's doing. It's worthy because then I think that's who Bill is at times. He's dedicated. He's not here so I can talk about him. He's dedicated. He's trustworthy. He's reliable. He's dependable. Right? Those are some good things about Bill that, that just come out by the dedication that he's got to what he's doing, the tasks he takes on. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 reads this, and I'll give you a moment if you want to go there. We'll read a few verses. I have them here, so I won't be turning to them, but Genesis 1 27. Some of you may know this one by heart. You don't even need to look it up. Genesis 1 27. The Bible says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. There's an image for us. When we're born, the Bible tells us we're made in the image of God. Physical form, you know, potential. When you're a baby, your, your path isn't set. You haven't made any choices yet that have impacted you in a way that you know, you didn't choose to get born. You, so you've all kinds of things out there possible for you. But our choices and the decisions we make after that point, then they shape the person we become. How we see our place in our family. So I was the youngest. It was my brother and I, Scott and I. And then when my dad married my stepmother, we had two more boys. I was still the youngest. So I was the youngest, right? One, I got blamed for everything. I got the brunt of the uh, bullying of the older brothers. But I got away with a lot of stuff too, right? So my place within our family was kind of that scapegoat, but also that, ha, ah, I can get away with it and you can't kind of thing, right? But how we interact with the people around us, like our friends and our school worker, our schoolmates and then our coworkers eventually, you know, often we can wrap our identity around things that really shouldn't be, like our work. We wrap our, our worth in the, the activities we do or um, our social circles, who we know. For those who were born in the church, I imagine that identity is focused on relationship, on a relationship with God and serving others. I, I really hope that that's the case. But if you weren't born into the church, then I imagine... Um, that image you have is vastly different. Um, the world probably had a strong influence on who you are, who you, who you see yourself to be. For me, 
Well, I imagine the world probably influenced you if you were born in the church as well, because maybe it helped solidify who you were in, in the church, because there's a vast difference in many cases. But for me, um, my image was that I was like a step in the evolutionary process, because that's what they teach in public school. And that um, if I was strong, right, strong, I use air quotes here, then I would be successful. In school, evolution was taught, may still be taught as fact. And um, the only real religion that I was exposed to in any detail was Greek mythology. I don't know why they pick that. Maybe because of the history of Greece and, you know, there's still a lot still there. But we studied Greek mythology in my school for like an entire year. So I knew all the Greek gods and all of the stories and the fairy tales and all of that kind of stuff. And, and so you begin to get this warped view that gods are really just imaginary things in people's minds and that only the strong survive, right? Because that's what evolution teaches. It's pretty warped to think about us, you and I, who we just read that verse, created in the image of God, actually just being creatures, just an advanced form of an ape, right? That, that still has all of those creature passions lurking below the surface. And the only reason they don't come out is because we're constrained by societal norms or culture. It's a very dangerous thought because what changes all the time? Societal norms change. Culture changes. And what might not have been acceptable in culture 10, 20, 30 years ago now is celebrated and is commonplace. <clears throat> so you can follow that train of thought now to if society thinks it's okay and I'm strong enough to do it, then it's okay because everyone will think it's all right. But what happens if something interrupts that process? That development of that image of who you think you are when an outside agency comes in and interferes with what's going on, it can be positive or it can be negative. So those in the church with a path following the Lord sometimes can get waylaid by something or someone. Matthew 7, 15 tells us to beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. It doesn't have to be a person though, right? It could be a situation or an event. It could be a death of someone. I remember in school, I had a friend, his name was Corky Baverstock, and his older brother, I know, his older brother had a strange name as well, but unfortunately it escapes me, but his older brother died in a car wreck when we were freshmen in high school. And Corky was never the same, and it was unfortunate. And so events can change who, who we imagine ourselves to be. My brother, for many of you who know, my brother committed suicide, my stepbrother, excuse me, committed suicide when I was, uh, I guess I just moved to Oklahoma, 1995. So in June of 96, I think it was. No, I came in 96. No, it was 95, yeah. So in June of 96, my brother committed suicide. Quite an impact on our family. I wasn't in the church. I didn't understand, you know, what, what happens afterwards. And, and so I imagined him, you know, at peace, resting. He had lots of mental issues, um, drugs and alcohol. There was a point in time where he went almost two weeks without sleep. That can, that can wreck a mind, right? I don't know if any of you have gone a day without sleep. 24 hours, I get kind of loopy. Can you imagine two weeks? Right, and so that event, that had an impact on our family. My, my, my parents' marriage at the time just started to fray. Um, I don't know if maybe they blamed each other. I don't know, but it can change. Events can change. It doesn't have to be a person. Ephesians 4.14 tells us this, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lay in wait to deceive. Nowadays, they use so much psychology and advertising, and they, they really have studied the human mind and how you can suggest things in a very subtle way that you don't even pick up on it that you're being suggested on. No, that's not right. You're being manipulated. You're like Pavlov's dog that Bryant mentioned this morning, right? 
You deserve it. Imagine yourself in the driver's seat. You know, things like that. Cars seem to be the ones that they really push you to try to buy. There's others, but I don't watch TV, so I don't really know those. I just remember that that's how it works, right? Management does the same thing. It's called management by objective. And the objective is to get you to do something that you might not otherwise do. Conform to... <laughs> Conform to the norms of the business or the norms of whatever, right? But it, hopefully it's in positive it intent, but it can be manipulated. We had to take an ethics class in school so that you don't manipulate people as a, as a manager or a leader because it's not difficult when you have authority over someone to use that authority to manipulate and manage them in a way to maybe glorify you, give you the credit, build you up so that you climb that ladder. <clears throat> so the choices that we make every day, those guide us along a path, right? You come to a fork in the road and you take the left side. Maybe that was the one the Lord wanted you to take. Maybe it's not. Obviously that our, our future path, and I had a conversation with my father about this actually, you know, that um, if the Lord has already predestined your future, then what choice do you have? You just live your life however and the Lord will work it out. Everybody will get saved, right? But I think there's, there's forks in our road where the Lord is, choose this one, don't choose that one. <sighs> All right, well, the next one, choose this one instead. And he tries to, tries to bring things and people into your life to help you make those right choices. A lot of that, though, depends on how you see yourself. We don't need to go down too many of those negative paths, though, to describe all that happens in order to actually see where the path God wants to lead us. But that path is important to know because there are truly only two paths. And there are only truly two types of people. And if you doubt that, just read your Bible. Because in the end, what are there? Two people. And there's two gates. Colossians chapter 3 verses 9 and 10. I'll give you a moment to go there. Colossians 3, 9 and 10. Colossians 3, 9, and 10. The Bible says, Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. The man there is mankind, not so much man. So let's think about this verse for a minute. Putting off of that old man or that old person, that old image of who you were, the Lord is saying you put that away, you put that aside. Baptism is that representation that when you go in the water, that old version of yourself is dead. And when you come out, you're that new creature, that new creation. The previous verses to that, um, they talk about things that are put off, like the traits and the habits. Right, let's, if you have your Bible open to that, let's, um, let's actually go back and look at a couple of those. Colossians, there it is. Colossians 3. <clears throat> Chapter 5, uh, verse 5 says, Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. idolatry. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language that comes out of your mouth. Do not lie one to another. That's verse 9. Since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. <clears throat> so we're told to put on a new man. We're told to put on a new image of who we are. Again, this is not, like I mentioned at the beginning, you can't do this yourself. Like, I'm a new guy now. I'm not going to do any of that stuff anymore. I got this now. I've been baptized. That's not how it works. That's the commitment that you make mentally, assenting to give your will to the Lord to, be, to go down that path, right? But 
it's not your own strength that does it. It's the Lord that does it. But he's telling you, because it's here, he's telling you that's what you do. And that's what happens. You put away these old things. Colossians 3, verses 12 through 17 um, reads this. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Verse 14, But above all these things, put on love. Some versions say charity. Put on love, which is the bond of perfection. So what is that new person you're supposed to put on? It's a good description right there of what that new person is. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body. And be thankful. Don't regret what you've given up, what is supposed to be behind you, that old man, old woman of self that is no longer who you are. Don't regret that and think, oh, if only I had, maybe I wouldn't be here. No, look forward. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You get a glimpse of what that new person is supposed to be now. Right? These are the things that help create the right image of who we're supposed to be. This new person is called the elect of God. Wow, that is an amazing title, right? To be the elect of God, that carries a bit of weight, a bit of responsibility. When you think of that, what image comes to your mind? Can you, can you picture in your mind something? Like the elect of God, is that a, someone dressed modestly and well, you know, they've well-groomed, Maybe, I don't know. Was Jesus the elect of God? How did he dress? We have to be careful that we don't put a false image on what godly people look like. Because as the, the verse we just read a few moments ago, they're ravening wolves in the church. Don't go by outward appearances because the Lord doesn't. He looks at the heart. We can't see that, but I mean, sometimes you can know by the fruits. We are not a whitewashed version of ourselves with corpses underneath. This new person we become when we claim Christ's name is supposed to begin the journey towards being like Christ. And like I mentioned at the beginning, the little things we change, those little steps that keep us on the path. We see the person we're supposed to be in the image of Christ. We know what we're supposed to be. But praise the Lord, he shows us what we are to him. He proved how much we are worth to him. We are worth every drop of his blood. That's how much we're worth. <clears throat> do you see yourself as the elect of God? Or do you still see yourself as that person who continues to fall? Who continues to see themselves as that person trying to quit smoking? Or do you think of yourself as the bride of Christ, the apple of his eye? Who do we think we are? Here's what the Lord thinks. In Jeremiah 29, 11, the Lord says, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. That's what the Lord thinks about us. Good things he wants best for us. He doesn't want us to continue to wallow in the way we were or to continue to slip and fall. That's not his desire for us. He wants everyone to be saved. The Lord does not want us to sin. He wants us to be strong in his power and in his strength. Surrendering who we are, who we were, or some of us may still be. Give it all up. 
Let go of the image of yourself that still falls and sins over and over. Because when the temptation comes, tell yourself that you are not that person. God has changed you. He told you he would. He would help you put on that new man or that new woman. Because he, he wants good things for you. He thinks good things towards you. His strength has made you whole. You don't do those things anymore. When that temptation comes to only tell part of the truth, be tra transparent, be honest. The Lord doesn't want us to lie by omission. He wants us to be firm in the faith. When you might be tempted to become angry at someone, you're not that person anymore. Tell yourself that. It's a lot easier to overcome it when you go, wait, I'm not that person anymore. I don't do that anymore. The reason this is so important and why I felt this message needed to be shared is we are in a, in a time when people, they don't know who they are. They're so confused. They're teaching children in kindergarten that they don't know who they are. They might be a boy. They might be a girl, but they just don't know yet. They're reading to them books that tell them that you don't know who you are. You might be a girl. You might be a boy. But we as Adventists, I don't know that we know who we are sometimes. We're blown and pushed by the society all over the place. We forget that we are not here to take a political stand or become activists. We are here to proclaim the gospel, to represent God and reflect his character to become more like Christ. Amen. Our memory verse <clears throat> says this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if it's, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, if you want to go there again, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Are all things new for you? Have old things passed away? Do you still listen to that music when you're in the car? Alone? Verse 18, now all things are of God who has reconciled us to him through Jesus Christ. The word reconciled means to bring back into alignment or to make good again, like in relationships, to bring them back into harmony. The Lord who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So not only do we become right with the Lord again, but then we're given the ministry to go help others become more like Christ, to get back into alignment with him. <clears throat> Verse 19, that is that God was in Christ, reconciling the word with the world to himself. I think that's pretty amazing because that tells us right there that the Lord did the work. We can't reconcile ourselves to the Lord very, very well at all, right? It, it's, it's not in our nature to be sacrificial or to be humble Right? We're taught that we're animals and the strongest of us survives. God did the work. That's pretty amazing. We didn't do anything because honestly we can't. But God did the reconciling of the world to himself by not imputing the trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Verse 20, now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. An ambassador, I looked up the definition of that because I think the version of our ambassadors in the world has kind of gotten tainted. We've had some pretty good ambassadors from our country to others and from others to ours, right? They rightly represent the country they come from. They don't take bribes. They don't, you know, take advantage of their position. Our ambassadors, a lot of times in other countries, they're not subject to the same laws of the country they're in. Like when we have ambassadors and diplomats come to the United States, our laws don't apply to them. Right? Our speeding laws, our driving laws. It might be weird to think about that, but they don't. 
We've had ambassadors from other countries get in car wrecks and kill people and they leave and you can't do anything about it. They're not subject to our laws. They're immune to our laws. But an, an ambassador, the, def, the definition is an accredited diplomat sent by a country as its official representative to a foreign country. Someone who, with authority to speak on behalf of that nation. We are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Be brought back into alignment, into harmony with God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Those verses have so many descriptions and the images that we need to have to understand what we're supposed to be doing. We are the elect of God. We are his ambassadors. We are to help people to become reconciled with God so that we might become the righteousness of God. It's a pretty powerful image that comes to my mind when I think about that, the ambassador for God. Do I speak the right words in the right situations? Or do I hold my tongue when I should? A lot of times that's what I default to is I just don't say anything because I don't want to say something wrong. Sometimes, you know, you leave people wondering why you did, didn't speak versus why you did. And some, <laughs> there's more to that verse. It's at least something like, leave people wondering why you, no, how does that go? It was on the wall in our other old house. It's a Mark Twain quote about opening your mouth. Um, leave people wondering why you didn't speak. Uh, yeah, and wondering, yeah, and then opening your mouth and removing all doubt about whether or not you're an idiot or something to that effect. <laughs> Sometimes spoken words can be detrimental. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> I just did it, didn't I? <laughs> so I want to ask you again, who do we think we are? Who do we think we are? Do we think, do we act, do we talk, do we live like the elect of God, the ambassadors of Christ, the apple of his eye? Are you still struggling to be free from your past life, the sins that so easily beset you? Maybe it's because you haven't taken a hard look in the mirror, which is Christ. You don't see yourself as an overcomer. Someone who is free from the act of sin. Someone who doesn't do that anymore. Someone who is not that anymore. That verse tells us that we are a new creature. You're new. You're not what you were. Such a powerful verse. Be that new creature, that new creation that God means you to be. Make the changes that enable you to be free. These are the, probably the most difficult. But like I said, little things can start. They can add up. But if those little things are in harmony with who you see yourself to be, they're stepping stones. Change your friends. Get rid of the temptations. Replace your reading material. Replace your music. Get rid of the makeup or, or any jewelry that may be harming you. If you were, so if you think back to the Bible, when the Israelites did something that they needed to be called out, this happens a couple times, when they're called out from doing something wrong, what did they usually have to do? They were called to give up their gold and their jewels and their jewelry and their rings and things and they buried them under a tree. Right? Because they had become symbols of something, of prosperity or of, of self-worship. <clears throat> Throw out the things that you know God doesn't want in your life. Think about the Lord. Read about Him. Dwell with a heavenly attitude, an attitude of prayer. Pray to Him. Be involved in His work. 
don't put yourself in a position where the devil has easy access to you. I remember Doug Batcher, of course, that's his book. He said, you can get orange juice in a bar. Right? But is that the right place to get juice? If you know that there's bad people in pool halls, do you go to pool halls to play pool? Maybe that's a, maybe you should be at home reading your Bible instead. Right? I've been to a few pool, hall, pool halls. They're not good places. There's one around the corner from the church here. Sometimes I laugh at the sign out front that they put like sayings. And sometimes I read them and I'm offended by them. Right? But they want to draw you in. They want, hey, this is an inviting place. Karaoke, right? It's difficult enough to live as a Christian today. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12 says this. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12. This is a sobering thing to think about because, like I just said, don't give the devil easy access because verse 12 says, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. We know it'll happen, right? So don't put yourself in a position where the devil can easily get to you because it's going to be hard enough. We know it'll happen without adding to the suffering by our poor, cho poor choices. So this image, it isn't something we can pull up our bootstraps and, and become, right? Through our own strength, we can't become this person that we want to be. But we can certainly have the image in our minds of what Christ wants us to be. Devoted, faithful, obedient. Don't touch that electric fence. If you were here this morning, you know the reference. You know, the Lord is pretty kind sometimes. He speaks to you and tells you, don't make that left-hand turn. That's my, that was the very, no, that was the second time that I remember hearing the Lord speak to me. The first time was the day that we went to the marriage conference when I was like, that was pretty, like, audibly speaking to me. The second time, I was getting ready to turn out of a gas station, and he said, don't make this left-hand turn. Go further up the corner. And I didn't, and then, bang, I got hit and totaled Helen's car. But praise the Lord, I was saved. I wasn't injured. So, you know, this image that, that we want to be in the Lord, what does it look like? Is it kind to our wife? Is it kind to the neighbor? who's difficult to be kind to because their dogs bark at all hours of the day or night. It's hard, I know, it's difficult. I've been in both of those situations. But that's the image we want to be. We want to be like Christ. So in closing, it's not a long message today, but in closing, we're here today, where those of you that are watching online, if you want to be like Christ... If that is your desire, you have that image and you really want to be that, then let's stand and we'll sing our closing song. Say with me in your mind, in your heart, I will put off the old person that I used to be and through God's strength and grace, I will put on and I will become the new creation he wants me to be. If that's your desire, let's stand and let's sing our closing song. Three hundred and twenty one, my Jesus, I love thee.
Father, thank you for the messages in the Bible that help to give us a clear image of you. Lord, I pray that we dwell upon that image so that we have a right image of what you have for us. Please help us to put away the old man and the old woman of sin and put on that new creation that you have for us. Give us the strength, Lord, the wisdom and the will to overcome. We thank you for that. We praise you for being with us today. I pray that this message touched the hearts of those that you needed it for and that you bless each one of us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.